Uh, welcome everybody and uh, everyone nice and cozy. It rained a few minutes ago, so I'm glad I didn't have to go out, but whatever will be, will be next time. Uh, we're very thrilled to have Dr. Shia Safin in our community. He and his wife came in Aria a few years ago, and um, he's prepared to speak to us tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about him, and this is only a small fraction of his CV, which is very impressive. Um, he was, uh, Dr. Shia Safin is an expert in diagnostic and therapeutic testing, quantitative analysis of complex data, medical information systems, immunopathology of infectious diseases, and neuropharmacology. He held a variety of key medical positions, including more than 20 years as a consulting pathologist at Smith Klein Beecham and Upjohn Clinical Laboratories, as well as medical director for two psychiatric hospitals and scientific director of the Neuropharmacologic Medical Group. He's a California native, and Dr. Safin earned his bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of California, Los Angeles, and he's held medical licenses in California, Maryland, New York, and New Jersey. In addition, he received a certificate in management from the Anderson School of Management at the UCLA. Dr. Safin has authored 60 scientific papers. Dr. Sutton resides in Israel and Maryland with his wife of 52 years. They are three adult children and 20 grandchildren. Ken Yabu, that's my words. His hobbies include woodworking, photography, customizing computer systems, appreciation of visual art forms, and cooking. His subject tonight, which he warned us might be changed, um, is respiratory and viral infections in Parashat Shavua. Right, and I now hand the microphone over to Dr. Shai Safin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, first, um, I'd like to uh, say um, something briefly in Hebrew to apologize for the fact that this is a lecture or a talk being given in Israel in English, which of course I'm much more comfortable with. But Ani Mitzta'er, Ivrit Shali Hasra at Tichom Latet at Hatsara Azot, Avalzu Haemet, Azani Adaber Anglit. So I, I really am sorry that I can't do this talk, but I don't have um, the sophistication to my Hebrew to uh, manage this. But I do have the ability to say thank you. There are a lot of people, uh, I had no idea about how many people who um, participated in making this event uh, a reality. And if I were to name some, I would be sure to leave out more than I named. So you'll just have to accept nameless thanks from me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. And um, I, I have to accept responsibility for confusing, um, for confusing uh, everyone with the title. And um, what I'd like to speak to you tonight about are um, the, basically the immunopathology of uh, vaccination and um, the social, economic, and political consequences of um, that process, which is now over 400 years old. And so um, when you think, you think about how I, I, I promise to uh, link this to the Parsha Hashkula, um, I, I will I will try and, and uh, actually make that happen. But, um, you know, when, when you realize you're gonna give a course and the, the students that are gonna sit in that course um, five years from now, um, or five years from when they're sitting there, will probably not remember anything, no matter what you've said. It's sort of a disheartening event. So um, I've always made it a point to make sure that I tell you what I think may stick five years from now and drill that home to begin with, because the rest of the talk 
um, no matter how interesting I think it is or you enjoy, um, probably in five years will not be with you. But there are some things that I think um, that are valuable. And since you are uh, all adults, some of this may seem redundant and hopefully some of it um, resonates with you because um, it has the uh, self-validation of your own experience. Um, one, there is no free or pure science. And it uh, doesn't matter where you hear it from, um, there isn't any of it. And um, it's vital that you follow the money and watch the politicians because um, that's uh, what manipulates the world. And lest you think I'm talking about today, um, for those of you who are Americans, you may recognize the name Cotton Mather. He was a Boston preacher at the time that the um, colonies chose to try and break away from the mother country. Um, and uh, he was uh, a proponent of a process that had been going on for hundreds of years before him called variolation in uh, the hope of dealing with smallpox which was a recurrent deadly viral illness that was the first to actually succumb to um, being eradicated. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that because um, it used to be that that was a very safe virus to work with in the laboratory because everybody was vaccinated. And of course, that's no longer true today. And hopefully, all the um, supplies of, um, of smallpox are stored securely in only two places, at least that was the agreement. And um, the other thing that I wanna make sure you understand and take with you and think about over the next part may seem heretical and that's okay. Um, I, I have a different take. Um, you, you must always remember that Darwin is in the room. And what do I mean by that? I mean, the process of natural selection, um, a, obviously designed by Hakodesh Borhu, is ongoing. And the fact that Darwin is associated with that process as a name doesn't say anything about the architect who put it together. And it's forever there changing biologic systems. And frankly, um, we are a biologic system just as the viruses we're going to talk about today are. And there are different orders of complexity, but um, in all these systems, change is a fundamental uh, for them to continue. And um, so if you remember, there's no free or pure science to follow the money and watch the politicians and that Darwin is in the room, um, that will be useful, I think, for you over the time. And the rest that I have to say um, may, may be enlightening and uh, hopefully informative. But if you hang on to those three points, I will have um, had a, a successful evening, in my opinion. What killed Sarah? This is Parshat Chai Sarah. It's a misnomer because the first thing we get, of course, is the death of Sarah. And um, what I can assure you was it wasn't viral infection. In fact, if you um, look, you see that disease, at least as we can infer it in the Torah, doesn't come about um, until Yaakov Avinu is dying. Um, Yaakov Avinu has a chance to sit, lie on his deathbed, give brachot and the like. And prior to that, if you uh, look carefully, people just died. Um, there was no period of time when they were um, ill, they just died. So clearly, Sarah did not die from a viral infection. But um, if you look at this Parsha, uh, it teaches you that um, you have to watch the money. Uh, you, don't, you have to be not afraid to overpay because Avraham clearly overpaid for the Maratha Machpela, but it was a unique item and he needed it. So 
Um, what we also learn from the Parsha is that um, what is yours is yours and you don't give it away, at least without a lot of thought. And if it isn't yours, you can't give it away. So those are all things that, that actually connect to um, viral illness. If you don't have it, you can't transmit it. And um, if you have it, you have to be careful about what you're doing with giving it to people. And um, that brings up um, all of the things that you're now familiar with. Um, I, I'm gonna talk um, about the history of this, but let me set for you your own experience in terms of um, what happened uh, in our lifetime with regard to um, what you saw unfold in your own lives. In, um, in the early 19s, mid 1970s, um, the World Health Organization declared smallpox wiped out. There was no animal reserve for the disease and we had finally vaccinated enough people in um, Northeast Africa to actually have gotten herd effect and there was no more smallpox. Yes, what you're reading about now, monkeypox, was a recognized problem at the time. Now, remember, this is 40 plus years ago that we knew that this would be a problem potentially, and um, it didn't bother anyone then. And it gets more than its fair share of uh, headlines today. But um, what was a problem and everyone was worried about, as you may remember, was swine flu. Now, swine flu was a problem because um, none of us were there, but if you remember back to the 1918 and 1919 pandemic that, that followed uh, World War I, uh, and the estimates there are between 20 and 70 million deaths worldwide, you understand why um, those of us who were working with um, flu vaccines and trying to be one step ahead, we're worried about swine flu. Now, as you know, that didn't turn out to be a problem, but the conversations that went on at that time, which included um, the people who are now at the head of the National Institutes of Health, at least in the United States, and um, those discussions talked about um, just what happened, calling a halt to everything for three weeks and then going back on with things. Well, you can see that um, those were the thoughts of relatively naive um, scientists who thought that people would stop because that would break an epidemic, a pandemic. And you know that, of course, that didn't happen, but um, how does this all relate to what goes on with vaccination and how did people come to that idea and um, lead themselves to believe that they could effectively, when there was no medical intervention, use um, social means to stop disease? Um, it's a good question and um, there are, are many answers to that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the development of what is uh, an important understanding, which is between the host and the parasite. You remember, um, we're the hosts and all of these bugs um, are in some sense at, at the highest level parasites, uh, especially the viruses because they don't make it without using our cells to replicate in. Now, um, I, we could talk about uh, bacterial vaccines of which there are many and are useful, but I'm gonna confine my, my talk to you today to dealing with viral vaccinations because um, one, you're very familiar with them, and two, um, most of the bacterial inf um, vaccines, um, many of you have never heard of or, or had or need a reason to have. Um, the only one 
probably that you know about is tetanus toxoid and um, and you know tetanus shots are are common and how that works and how the toxoid was developed it's a very interesting story I'm not going to tell it all right um, but I am going to start uh, back in uh, about 18 maybe 1884 1885 with um, the um, work of um, a very famous Nobel laureate by the name of Eli Metchnikoff, who uh, proposed a theory of cellular immunity. Now, remember, um, the microscope was standardized for the first time in 1860. There had been microscopes from the 1500s, but um, a constant, reliable, um, useful scientific instrument um, wasn't a practical tool that was available widely. But in the end of the 18th century, there was in fact reliable microscopy. And so these cells were visible, but the staining technology and um, the preservatives and the like clearly didn't do the job that uh, we can do today. But there were um, ideas put forth that there were cells in the body that ate the pathogens that attacked us, which of course today we know as white blood cells of many different varieties. And we're going to talk today about a little bit about phagocytes, but mostly we're going to talk about lymphocytes. And the reason we're going to talk about them is that um, we don't measure them very often. And it turns out that they're the source of what vaccination actually is on a long-term basis. You've heard about antibodies going away. Um, everybody has been uh, um, inundated with uh, the disappearance curve of, of COVID antibodies. Well, these are circulating protein molecules that no matter what you do, always go away. And what you're really interested in is whether or not the vaccine or natural infection has conferred long-lasting immunity. And that depends completely on the cellular immune system. Now, um, probably very few of you have heard anyone attempt to talk to you about the cellular immune system in viral infections. And the reason that people don't talk about that is that it's hard to do. Um, the Quest Diagnostic Laboratories um, does over 4,000 different kinds of tests. In those 4,000 tests, um, they do only one cellular immunity test. Um, and that one it happens to be for tuberculosis. And um, why is that? because cells um, need to be cared for very specially and transported specially and they're fragile. And to do that consistently um, has not been um, a very successful process uh, to date. And so while we have all of these easy to measure processes um, that go on in the serum, measuring the cellular immunity um, is difficult. Now, it turns out that um, the US um, Food and Drug Administration did approve a cellular immune test for COVID. Um, but I'll bet none of you ever heard of it. And what you all know about is antigen testing and nucleic acid testing. And um, that's because nucleic acids are relatively more durable and proteins are relatively more durable than our cells. And hence, the important question um, of whether or not you're really immune um, has only been answered in a, a few cases in research laboratories. In, um, in early 2020, when uh, the COVID epidemic pandemic was getting started, um, there was a group in Singapore affiliated with the Duke University of North Carolina that did an interesting study. 
that looked at the cellular immunity of people who had been infected with SARS-1, uh, severe acute respiratory virus one, we call COVID SARS-2 and um, SARS-2 and another virus that you may have heard of, MER, and um, that was um, another member of the coronaviridae family that had been um, so virulent that it had sent, essentially blown out its populations and um, not spread well. Too hot a virus to be effective. And um, they looked and saw that um, it was possible to show um, in people who had been infected in 2003 in the SARS-1 outbreak, the same level of immune response as people who had just recently recovered from SARS-2. So it was a very interesting study, not very often uh, called to people's attention, that says that, that these infections in fact confer, at least in many people, durable immunity. Now, um, since the beginning of virology, there were four known coronaviruses that circulated that did nothing but cause colds. And uh, frankly, um, those viruses were the prototype for what we thought was going on. And then, you know, the story of all the intrigue. But before we get to the story of the intrigue, I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the technology of how vaccines are made and how biotechnology has progressed uh, because it gives me a chance to show you that uh, there is no pure science and you need to follow the money. And um, it turns out that um, with uh, Pasteur, um, who you recognize the name of and uh, think of probably many things with, but um, most of his work was actually done with um, bacterial um, vaccinations and antitoxins. And um, I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about what was the work he did with rabies. And um, because it was the first attempt to uh, passage a virus uh, enough times in a different but susceptible host to attenuate the virulence. Um, well, um, he was successful. In fact, the Pasteur treatment for rabies um, was the standard until probably 40 years ago when um, a duck embryo process replaced it. But the point is that serial passage in different species was used to attenuate or pick out strains that were crippled. Now, how did that happen? Well, it happened because Darwin was in the room, all right? What happened was that you could pick out from the process of replicating these particular parasites, weakened ones that were still infective, that still had the antigen components that were necessary for immunity, but didn't infect um, and cause fatal disease. And uh, that was a useful thing. In fact, um, people tried it uh, for everything and it almost worked. But then there was another approach that was taken and it was started um, back in the 1930s by a couple of people who were looking for polio. Now, none of us probably um, have uh, direct experience with polio, although there are still some in uh, our generation that um, have had that ex personal experience, but um, almost everybody was vaccinated either with the Salk or the Sabin vaccines. And by that, I don't necessarily mean that there was theirs. The Europeans made their own after the same process. But in America, there was always consternation. Jonas Salk was made to be a hero because in about 1955, he came up with um, a 
polio, an inactivated polio vaccine that um, was effective in preventing polio. Trivalent did well. The only problem was that the original vaccine, of course, had a, had a monkey virus in it. And um, that in itself was a, a problem enough to get it recalled. But, but more than that, um, Jonas Salk didn't do anything that we hadn't already given the Nobel Prize for. He took the tissue culture process and grew these cells. The, in, in the cells he could grow, he grew poliovirus of three different strains and then formal and inactivated it. So Robbins, Weller, and Enders got the Nobel Prize for cell culture and Salk used it to make the vaccine. So it was another inactivated vaccine. And this was the big hit is here was that it was virus grown in cells for the first time. Guess what? That was a useful technology, but like everything else, it had its limits. So what happened, there's another guy by the name of Albert Sabin, who said, what if I look for viruses that will replicate, but can only replicate in the gut because they're temperature sensitive mutants. And so a new technology was born. Viruses that are live and replicate but can't cause disease. Now, um, everyone's, I'm assuming everyone's children and grandchildren and maybe themselves have had mumps, measles, and rubella. And that of course um, is, uh, those are uh, temperature sensitive mutants that do replicate, but um, unless you're immunocompromised, don't usually cause disease. Now measles is a terrible disease. Um, I don't know if you know the story, so I'll tell it. Um, in the time of, um, of Darwin and the voyage of the Beagle, there was a lot of people going around the world looking to see what was there. And um, an English ship stopped in the uh, islands of Tierra del Fuego and um, found a population there of a few hundred natives who had uh, been isolated for no one was sure how long, but uh, they logged that and went on. And um, decades later, somebody went back and there, were, there was nobody there. There were, there were skeletal remains. And from that, we actually could tell that what had been gone on is measles had infected the population that was completely susceptible and had killed them all. So lest you think measles was just a red rash, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible disease. Mumps, you know, um, is the cause of um, both encephalitis and, uh, and um, um, reproductive difficulties with uh, males. And um, rubella um, is, um, of course, the scourge of pregnant women. And so these vaccines are, um, play a central role in what they can do for um, humanity. And um, there's um, an, an expensive entire volume called Vaccines, the senior author of whom is Stanley Plotkin. And, and I will leave the chapter on the history of vaccination in the library for anyone to uh, get easy access to. This is from the seventh edition. The eighth edition is due out um, the first quarter of next year. And um, I'll see if I can get that updated for you then, which will carry Zika and HPV and, and uh, SARS and, and shingles and these things. Um, I, I would um, tell you, that um, there's a question of how do we get together um, social policy, which is what drives preventative medicine and um, the science of what's safe and efficacious. So the, the problem here is that um, you, you have schools, 
and you can mandate whether or not your children can come to school and be vaccinated. And the, the question here becomes, um, why would you not want to have your child protected? Well, of course you would, but you wanna be sure that they're protected and not harmed. And um, it's not clear, and I'm sorry to tell you, I've always been puzzled about what goes on in the minds of the anti-vaxxers. Um, you've um, seen what happens when people develop a new technology. It allows things to happen like they've never happened before. Um, witness the fact that we're doing um, this lecture on Zoom and nobody thinks twice about a Zoom lecture because we've all become familiar with that technology because we had to. Um, but now let's talk about um, being able to take a process that used to take a decade to develop. And um, many of you have had the, um, the Shingrex um, shingles vaccine, uh, or even before that, the, the Zosterex, um, the live varicella vaccine. That vaccine um, took 14 years to come into the American uh, marketplace. Why, why did it take 14 years? Because of what it was and how it worked. Um, it's actually very equivalent to the hepatitis B vaccine that many of you have received as well, but they were slow processes. Now you have a pandemic and you have instant communication and you have a world sitting there afraid that they're gonna die. And back to reasonable fear. In fact, today in the United States, the death rate from COVID is a couple of hundred people a day. That's about twice the death rate from influenza A, which happens every year, but it's, it's not an inconsistent, inconsiderable number. It's 100,000 people a year. It's a lot of people dying. It's not like the millions that have been claimed to die from it. But the question is, what was the world going to do? Well, I, I need you to flash back a few years to Zika. Now, I don't know if you all remember the Zika virus because it made a brief appearance when it looked like um, women who were pregnant were being infected with this virus and having babies who um, suffered the consequence, uh, not as severe as rubella in some cases and worse. Um, and we geared up a technology to deal with this. Um, it worked well in, in animal systems, but we never got a chance to really test it in humans. And it's the messenger RNA vaccine. Now, um, you've all probably heard that word thrown around, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't wanna go into the molecular biology too deeply for you, but really what you need to know is messenger RNA doesn't frequently circulate in any high concentrations in the body. So there was a question of what would happen if we did that and put it into biologic systems like people. Normally, when you develop a vaccine um, in that 10-year period, you get to test about 4,000, maybe 6,000 people at most over 10 years. It's expensive to do, takes a lot of time. It's a lot of people, but stop and think. What level of abnormality can you find? If you test 4,000 people, you can only find an event that's as rare as one in 4,000. That's all there is that you can find because that's all your sample allows. So um, the standard was set to 10 times that high for the mRNA vaccines. And guess what? That allowed you to find events that were one in 40,000, but not one in, in billions or not 16 in a billion. You know, 
there, there's no question today that uh, we have the ability to find and report extremely rare events. And um, some of them um, can be inflated um, because um, I'm not sure if it's true everywhere, but drawing on my experience in America, there's a historic understanding in, in, the, in journalism that says, if it bleeds, it leads. Meaning that if there's if there's something that that is oozing, that's the story you talk about. It doesn't matter whether you have the story straight or if you even can get the story straight. That's the thing that will sell newspapers. And after all, advertising dollars are what drive these publications. So um, that's that's a major problem. But um, on the other hand. You, you need to know that um, the vaccines that have been given, these new technology messenger RNA vaccines, um, have now been tried in billions of people. And we, we can see that at least short term, there isn't anything grossly um, that we, we have uh, uncovered. Now, you never know what, what goes on in the long term. Um, I don't know how many of you know about um, the neuropathy of polio disease that doesn't show up, disease, not vaccination, disease that shows up 50 years after the acute infection. So it, it may be that 50 years from now, we know something that we don't know now, um, but uh, I see no way to know that. And uh, we're, we're sort of stuck with knowing what you know and, and going forward. And um, when you think about the vaccine, then it, it has to go hand in hand with thinking about the testing. Because all of you now know if you, if you have symptoms that are flu-like and maybe your sense of smell is disturbed, you should get a test for COVID. Um, now, there are two problems with that, to be very honest. One is there are false positives. One is there are false negatives. But the false positives come in a couple of different ways. If you're looking at antigen testing, and we'll put it aside for a minute, that's one case. But if you're looking at uh, PCR, it's polymerase chain reaction, for those of you who under, uh, always wondered what PCR was, um, another Nobel Prize for amplifying uh, nucleic acid specific processes. You can find one molecule of nucleic acid with this technology. But uh, the problem is that one molecule won't infect somebody. And no matter what you find in the way of nucleic acid, um, you can't be sure that the nucleic acid, unless it gets to the very high levels, is actually telling you anything about infectivity because the presence of the nuclear, the nucleic acid of the virus does not correspond one-to-one -one with infectivity. So even when you do PCR, you don't know if you're able to transmit that from one person to another. So you get false positives by finding stable nucleic acid, which isn't infective because the technology allows that. And you wind up with false antigen testing as well, both positive and negative, because of the nature of the amount of the antigen, the sample, there are a number of reasons. You get technical problems. What you don't fail to get, though, is a charge. Every single one of those tests somebody is paying for. Watch where the money goes, okay? And so now we have pharmaceutical companies that have a vested interest, although there may be an altruistic interest as well. We have lab testing companies, which have an altruistic and a fiscal responsibility. And when you mix those two together, it's always difficult when you add politics of who's going to pay. So I tell you that, um, lest you ever doubt this, you and I pay for that. Government 
even when they run the printing presses and inflate the um, M1 supply, um, we pay for it. So understand that there were no free tests, there was no free vaccination, and there was no free and pure science. Despite that, we try and do the best we can. And given that we have all of these impurities, you can see where if you were interested in um, undercutting the decisions that have been made um, by people who may have had vested interests, it's not a hard thing to do. You can create speculation, doubt, um, extreme views, polarize society, and um, it's not clear to me that anybody benefits from that, but it clearly does happen. And so um, the thoughts of the anti-vaxxers uh, come from a fact that there is no certainty in what we do. We make the very best decisions that we can at the time we're making them, and they're subject to the limits of our knowledge at the time. And so um, I can say to you that um, we're all fallible and we've, um, we have a, a lifetime of experience with our own failures, but that doesn't mean we didn't try our best. And you have to witness the fact that that's all that's going on in public health and medicine today and preventative medicine, because that's the best we can do. Um, Melissa, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, take questions for a little bit. All right, thank you. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, I believe you have the capability to unmute yourself and I will put everybody on gallery so we can all see. What would your recommendation be if amongst the family, you have a family that absolutely refuse to have any, inject, any um, vaccination given to their children or to themselves. And I mean from the time that the children are having, that's it, when the babies and they have for measles and everything, and their family refuse. Um, you know, it's a, unfortunately, it's a, a question that it's not the first time I've heard it. And um, I'm not sure that um, the answer is as satisfying as I'd like it to be. I, I honestly think you have to um, consider that people who can't um, see any benefit to it are immune to logic and um, that... Um, the children and, and presumably grandchildren who are subject to th that process um, probably can't be reached in a logical fashion. And if they want to send the kids to school, um, at least in many jurisdictions, they can't go without being vaccinated. So they'll have to be homeschooled and it will shape the entire life, both of that of parents and children and grandparents and it, it may not have a bad outcome. And um, I think that a discussion that says you're, you're making a decision for yourself and for your children that we don't agree with and we don't believe is based on logic, but that doesn't change our love and appreciation for you, but yeah. we're not going to change logic and, and reality. If you don't want to see it as that, then... Um, then we do our very best. Thank you. Hi, this is this is Mitch. I have a question. Um, science, I, I'm no scientist, but I'm just interested to know how the perceived benefits, in immunization benefits of having had COVID interact with the perceived benefits of having had a vaccine um, against COVID because there may be many people around who have some combination of a history of having incurred COVID whilst also having had a series of vaccinations. Are you able to make any observations about that? Um, I can, there's some literature that actually points to 
exactly that question. And um, it turns out that um, there have been, um, I, I'm gonna make the point again. Darwin has been in the room all along. And um, if you, you stop and think, um, this isn't very different from influenza A. Every year we um, try, and I hate to sound like this, but it's true. We try and guess what the prevailing strain of influenza is going to be for the next year and give people immunization against that, which is only 50 to 60% effective, all right? So there are two levels of response. One, the people who have had natural infection with COVID had one particular strain and it's unfortunate, but there have been strains that were able to escape the antibody and cellular response of the previous strain. And so we vaccinated people to try and cover that. And that's what we do with influenza. And it's what we're doing now with uh, COVID. And um, it's a strategy that makes some sense. Um, and I, I can tell you that uh, in the face of reinfection with a similar strain, the people who had natural infection tend to make a better, uh, that is stronger response than the people who were vaccinated. So uh, the vaccine um, is equivalent, but not as good. And do they sit side by side with each other and have an aggregated benefit? Um, so that's an, an interesting question. Um, remember, these different strains um, have engendered different immune responses. So um, the response to um, two different strains can, can sit side by side, uh, happily and be equivalent. But a third strain could come along that neither of those uh, were effective against. And you would be susceptible oh, again. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Suffin, sorry. I have one technical question which follows on from what Mitch uh, was talking about. Um, I was told that the um, having had the infection, you are protected against the envelope of the virus for COVID virus, whereas the vaccination protects you against the spike protein. Um, and the, the spike protein is the one that, 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 that changes uh, with each variant, um, whereas the envelope doesn't change so much. Is that why perhaps in this case, people who've had the virus um, are more protected from it? And why does that not happen with say influenza? I mean, influenza is that a different complete thing. And then I've got another question afterwards, which I'll come back to after somebody else has had a go. Okay, uh, I, I'll be happy to tell you. Um, so it's true, the mRNA that uh, is in the vaccine codes for the spike protein. But what happens to that is that the cells, not, not uh, the usual cells that are infected actually, but um, many cells in the body um, actually take up, remember the, the spike protein is, is incorporated in a little lipid capsule that delivers it, gets it inside the cell and the cell machinery doesn't know any better and it just churns out this protein which migrates to the surface of the cell. And an immune response is engendered against the spike protein. Now there are other envelope proteins um, and it turns out that why, why did you pick, why did we pick as a, a community of uh, folks, the spike protein uh, to make the mRNA to? Because it turns out that the spike protein is what attaches to the cell to permit infection. All right, so blocking that infection um, by attaching an antibody to the spike protein prevents disease. Your question is, how come since the spike protein is mutating, um, we, we don't get um, a response that would be better to the entire um, viral capsids that you get when you're infected? And the answer to that is that not all of those antibodies 
prevent infection, but they do a good job of doing lots of things in circulation. And uh, the immunity um, of a virus uh, to a virus is complex. Think about it. The virus has to rupture and get out of the cell before it can go and infect another cell. So when it does that, it's exposed completely to all of the antibodies that are being made and um, what impact those antibodies have um, in terms of infection is what really counts. So you, you, you may clear virus that's still infective in somebody who's got natural infection and has antibodies to more than the spike protein, but um, you're clearing infectious virus in that fashion. If you are full of antibody, either from natural infection or from immunization that binds to the spike protein, you don't get infection. And uh, so that's good, but um, that's the story with um, why um, you, you may have more antibody and it may be of some uh, use and it may be a better form than um, straight spike, but like influenza, where there are two different, there's a neuraminidase and a hemagglutinin, and they both are required. The spike protein binds to a receptor on the cells um, that's used um, for many things, one of which is blood pressure regulation. And so you may have heard that people taking a certain class of blood pressure medicines um, did better with, uh, with COVID infection. And you may have also heard that males died more from COVID because the density of those receptors in the lungs in men are higher than in women. All of that's true, which just means that the, the opportunity to infect is greater in some people than others. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. I've got one more question, which is not technical. <laughs> uh, yeah, go the, for it, Michael. The, um, the fact that we've actually managed to uh, get this MRA, uh, MRI, um, MRA technology uh, so quickly out now, um, we wouldn't have been able to do this years ago. Um, and it's, do you see that what we've learnt up to now and what we're learning from the, uh, the research that we've done, that doctors have done, scientists have done, is actually something that has sort of bringing us into a sort of a new world of knowledge and will help us sort of in the future uh, development of med medicines and, uh, and uh, vaccines. So I can answer that with one word, absolutely. I, I could tell you a story about, uh, about how, we, how we've gone through that proteins and with making antibodies. If you look at the immunotherapies of cancer today, largely done with monoclonal antibodies, um, the, the technology of developing and being able to select those monoclones um, has changed um, cancer therapy uh, so dramatically uh, that um, it may may not have gotten the press as a technological breakthrough, but it was. And mRNA technology is in fact a giant breakthrough and the ability to, to put forth um, all sorts of new tools is just opening. There's gonna be some dramatic changes in medicine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've exhausted everyone or exhausted the questions at least. I've got a question. Please. Okay. Can you address the issue, not so much of vaccinations, but of the efficacy of masks? Um, <laughs> whether they, um, uh, whether they work for the person wearing the mask as a preventative, in terms of contracting disease, or are they more useful, especially if you're dealing with something like an N95 mask, uh, to 
prevent others from catching their diseases. You often see, for instance, in Tokyo on the subway, uh, people walking around with masks because they have colds so they don't infect others. So, um, Chuck, that's really a great question. And I'm glad you brought it up because um, you, you may remember early on um, in the COVID story, um, <laughs> Very conflicted data, but but what was the biggest problem was getting everybody to understand that this was not a droplet infection, and by that I mean the size of the exhaled particles that were carrying infectious loads of virus were below five microns, and those particles could hang in the air for hours, especially in closed environments. So in that sense, um, the value of a mask um, that was at the level of an N95 respirator um, without a valve um, was significant. But as you may have recalled, N95 masks were like almost impossible. And the people who wanted them were the uh, first responders and the ER staffs and the like. And um, so when you looked at the studies that were being done on what were heterogeneous series of uh, different uh, devices, um, the data, the answer was very, um, very conflicted. So um, I, I have to tell you that um, the data says that if you wear a mask, uh, N95, P100, um, you're protected and you protect everyone else. Um, people don't like walking around in respirators, um, but it is a terrific device for protecting uh, yourself against inhalation infection. It's a silly question. Do we still need to keep the windows open in the shoe? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so to me, um, your the question is, um, what were you trying to accomplish by keeping the windows open? If you were trying to exchange air and get rid of it, you need to have laminar flow, right? You need to get the stuff moving from one direction to the other, and it and it needs to be. Um, engineered so that you actually are cleaning the process. Now, um, I don't see that as going on. Um, and so I'm not sure um, that it's very effective. Um, but on the other hand, you are exchanging um, and changing, but um, I can't give you a real honest answer about how much good you're doing. 